Well, welcome to part two of Europa Rising. In the last session, of course, we reviewed the biblical background as to why so many scholars have been for centuries looking for a revival of the Roman Empire from the biblical text. We also reviewed how Rome fragmented in all those pieces each had their day in court, so to speak. And, uh, but as Daniel prophesied, those pieces are coming back together in what apparently is a resurrection, if you will, of that ancient empire, at least in part. So in this session, we're going to look at the European Union today and what are its prospects. Now, it, one of the questions that we should keep open, be thinking about, is it true? Is this empire being revived? You need to realize the Master's Treaty obsoleted the Treaty of Rome, the fabled treaty that started much of this. And the Master's Treaty provides for a centralized European superstate, a common foreign policy, a common military, a common currency, and common judicial proposals. And very radical, many people don't realize how extreme the Master's Treaty reached. But it's interesting as you review these things to realize we're dealing here with an entity that has an economic potential larger than the United States. We have a population of 280 million. Europe has a population of 446, depending on which ones end up joining. There are five European Union institutions. The Commission, of course, is the executive arm. It's equivalent in our thinking of, of the executive branch. It's really controlled by the Council of Ministers of the member nations. It also has a parliament that's formed in 1958. It's interesting that the uh, emblem of the European Parliament is a woman riding a beast. And uh, this is a, a snapshot of just a postage stamp which happens to feature the European Parliament's emblem. And again, to uh, biblical scholars, it's rather provocative because of Revelation 17, 18, and so on. But uh, there's also a, council of, uh, a court of justice and a court of auditors. And another feature is the European uh, uh, Council and the European Central Bank. The Central Bank was established the 1st of June of 1998, and it's based in Frankfurt am Main in Germany, and it aims to maintain price stability uh, for a, with a single monetary policy. We'll talk more about that because it has implications that few people, I think, fully appreciate. This emblem of Europe, of course, uh, I might mention that it, it, there's a classic painting by an Italian artist that um, it's called The Rape of Europa, and it deals with an affair between the Greek god Zeus and the legendary beauty Europa. In Greek mythology, Zeus spotted and fell in love with the young princess as she picked flowers. And he changed himself into a handsome bull and carried her off to the island of Crete, where she bore him three sons. That's part of the legend, but it may very well be the background from which the European continent has been named from Greek mythology. But let's move on. The European Union, of course, is seeking enlargement. And that enlargement is following what we call the Copenhagen criteria, which we reviewed in the previous session. What's interesting is they're not creating barriers for these uh, uh, countries uh, without helping them. They're actually funding uh, the acquisition of these member uh, nations. 67% of direct investment into these candidate countries was of EU origin in the first place. Over the last six years, the total trade between Europe and these candidate countries has increased 300 percent. That's over 200 billion dollars per year. And uh, what's interesting is the European Union enjoys a trade surplus of over 25, almost 26 billion dollars per year in trading with these candidate countries. To put that in perspective, the United States has a record trade deficit, not a surplus, a deficit, of $435 billion per year. So in contrast, Europe is in a positive trade surplus basis with uh, their candidate countries uh, in contrast to the deficits that we have not only, don't confuse this with our federal debt, we also have a huge federal debt. This is the trade deficit. Every year um, we uh, buy more than we sell to the tune of over $400 billion per year. The European Union also provides direct assistance to each of these candidates of over $3 billion per year, and it does that through pr three programs, one called FAIR, the ISPA, and the SAFARD, and all of this adds up to over $3 billion. We'll take a quick look at each of these. The FAIR was done by a council regulation back in 89, 
and it provides direct financial assistance to provide for pre-accession support. For example, they have a, a part of it, about 20, 30 percent of that budget is for institution building, structures, strategies, human resources, management skills, all those things that are needed to strengthen their economic, social, and regulatory and administrative capabilities. And uh, Another, the rest 70 percent is goes to what they call aquis related investment and that's co-financing economic uh, uh, social uh, institutions promoting market economy and capacity to cope with competitive pressures things of that nature and also investment in the infrastructure uh, to secure compliance with in such areas as food safety uh, making the frontiers secure uh, testing and measuring equipment related to consumer protection all that kind of thing and uh, now the budget under this one provision is uh, almost two billion euros per year. A second program is called IPSA. It stands for Instrument for Structural Policies for Pre-Accession. This provides financial support for environmental uh, uh, and transport uh, 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 needs. It's, it's drinking water, wastewater management, solid waste management, air pollution, those kind of things. And the Trans-European Transport Network. Uh, is mostly uh, most of the money is going for improvement of the rail uh, transport, about 40 percent for roads and a handful of other things, even uh, an airport or two. Uh, the budget for IPSA is about seven billion dollars. Now that's not per year; that's spread over a seven-year period. And uh, they, most of it's going to Poland and Romania, uh, and uh, but they're spread among all the candidates that we'll be talking about here shortly. And the other program is SEPARD. And uh, it's a special accession program for agricultural and rural development. And uh, it's about uh, half a billion a year. And uh, it's uh, processing and marketing improvements, 26%. Agricultural holdings, 20%. Rural infrastructure, it's the primary focus of it. And other diversification. Um, and again, Poland and Romania are the biggest challenges. A lot of the smaller ones also getting assistance from the European Union so that they can qualify for membership in the first place. Now, what are these candidates? Well, the Central European states, we have Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Um, in the uh, Baltic states, the traditional Soviet uh, republics of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are joining the European Union. And the, and the two Mediterranean islands, Cyprus and Malta, are also uh, candidates uh, to join uh, within the next 12 months. And so let's just take a quick look at these. This, this is the European Union as reviewed in the previous session, the existing states that are there. We're adding Poland, which has a, 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 a very unwieldy agricultural sector. That's the big challenge. They have about, uh, that's about 27% of the workforce. And it's one of the most difficult for the European Union to really swallow. And uh, uh, its population is about a little under 40 million. And, uh, about 172 GDP in euros, and I won't go through all the numbers here. Um, the next one to join is Hungary. It's very well prepared politically and economically, and uh, the one problem they have that's creating some concern are the treatment of minorities called Roma. You and I would know them as the gypsies, a traditionally nomadic people uh, that throughout the world, but the term, uh, there actually is a, a common biological, ethnic, uh, linguistic group uh, called Roma, and uh, th these are a minority that are a source of, of concern uh, throughout the region, but especially in Hungary. And uh, again, a population of about 10 million in total, and uh, uh, again, uh, not, not bad unemployment. Some of the unemployment, some of these are very, very difficult, very, very high. We have the Czech Republic. Czechoslovakia is split into two, as you recall. Well, Czech Republic is one of those uh, two, and it is uh, one of the best prepared candidates they have. Um, it's got some disputes with Austria over some nuclear plants and some other things, but it looks like it's all, it's, it's, it's a very, it's uh, done well because it's, of its position as a neighbor to Austria, and both Austria and Germany. So there's high levels of foreign investment. It's doing quite well. About 10 million people, and, uh, uh, but uh, unemployment about 8%. We have, uh, we have uh, Slovakia, that's the other half of what you all of us know as Czechoslovakia. Um, it's passed an important hurdle just this year, and uh, it, uh, there are some concerns. Typically, in each of these countries, there's concerns by the EU of uh, money laundering, crime, and uh, infrastructure, uh, civil infrastructure issues that they're dealing with, with budget. And uh, only 5 million people here, but uh, a unemployment of 20%. And then we have Slovenia. And it's the only candidate country from the former Yugoslavia. 
that uh, it was also the most prosperous after Cyprus of all of these, per capita income of some 70% of the European Union average. And uh, so, there, but it still has some challenges and they're working those through. A population of less than 2 million, a uh, small little country, uh, unemployment about uh, under 6% and so on. All of these are major trading partners with the EU in the first place anyway. And then we have uh, Estonia. This is one of the traditional Baltic republics of the Soviet Union. Its trade is predominantly with the EU already, and there's a, a levels of inward foreign investment per capita are among the highest in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, so it's, uh, the Estonians, interesting enough, have really taken to information technology. They're boasting the largest number of internet connections of all the uh, European candidate countries. And a population of about a million and a half, and the, but the unemployment's up 12%, which is uh, some concern. Um, Next is Latvia. It's got a functioning market economy, yeah, but it still needs reform because it's not quite finished with its privatization program, still vestiges of the, the Soviet rule. And uh, one, uh, one of its problems also is the uh, treatment of minorities. In this case, the largest minority are ethnic Russians. And, uh, so, uh, and those, they lack citizenship, so they've got some issues to deal with there. And uh, the European Commission is talking about giving them a new language law to make it easier for the minorities to integrate into Latvian society and, and so forth. And uh, so they all have their challenges. I'll spare you all the details, but they're all very similar, typically social infrastructure issues. Here we're talking about 2.5 million people and uh, unemployment about 16%, getting up there. And then we have Lithuania. It's really a bridge between the Russian Baltic enclave Kaliningrad uh, in, 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 in the, into the west of Lithuania and uh, the mainline, mainland of Russia. And so it's acting as a corridor there. They've taken, uh, they've arranged uh, some special open borders paperwork so that the Russians can get transit documents at the border to transit Lithuania to get to Kaliningrad and so forth. So there's some post-Soviet problems to work out, but it seems to be going well. Everybody's quite encouraged. Unemployment is, is persistently high, but uh, those things are all being dealt with. Then we have this, probably the littlest of them all, Malta. Is a, it's a, it meets all the economic conditions for membership, interestingly enough. Unemployment is relatively low, and, uh, uh, but the GDP growth has been steady, and uh, it's been part of the free trade zone with the EU since back in 71. Um, since Bob Cornuke has just discovered the four anchors of Paul that were uh, discharged in Acts 27, the famous shipwreck scene, uh, by following the details in Luke's account in Acts 27, he found the anchors exactly where the Bible implied they are. That's all been validated. But that's also going to lead to increased uh, tourism. It's, it's, a, it's going to be a big thing, we believe. So anyway, Malta uh, has a bright future ahead of it. Uh, it's an easy problem. Uh, you're dealing with only 400,000 people total, and uh, the, the unemployment's low and heavily tourist-oriented. And there, that, there is Malta, a little tiny island. Uh, in the Mediterranean. Then we have Cyprus, and it's following, following the uh, Turkish invasion of 1974. It complicates the, uh, because there's a whole dispute between Greece and Turkey, especially over the northern part of the island. But those things are uh, seem to be uh, being worked out. There's some threats both ways, but uh, it's going to be turbulent. But it looks like that's on track to come into. And again, we're dealing with a small item, very low, now low on uh, low unemployment in the southern part of the island. There is major problems in the in the uh, and economic turmoil in the northern Turkish part. But uh, that's Cyprus. So there we are. Now, those are all scheduled to enter the uh, European Union by 2004. There are three other candidates, two of them scheduled in 2007, Bulgaria and Romania. Now, Bulgaria, I mean Romania, is uh, along with its neighbor Bulgaria, is due uh, to join in 2007. It's making slow progress, adopting the European Union Legislation, it's passed laws, it's, 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 it's accomplishing a lot, but there's, there's, big, there's big work ahead of it. That's why this, the EU has budgeted substantial support to bring them uh, into uh, qualification for membership. 22 million people, unemployment is not that large. It is, uh, again, though, agriculturally based. And uh, we have uh, Bulgaria also uh, scheduled the same also in 2007. And uh, there it's, uh, it's got uh, economic uh, challenges that are being that the EU is assisting them with, so it looks like it'll be on schedule too. You're talking about uh, 15 million people there, 
And, uh, but in, unemployment's up to 19%. It's up there pretty high. So that, that's the enlarged EU, um, as you see on the map here. Uh, the, the dark blue on the map is the existing uh, EU. The light blue are the nations that are joining. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Slovenia. And uh, then in 2007, we have two more. We have Romania and Bulgaria. So that creates, is the, is the, uh, the uh, lineup as it stands with one enigma remaining. And that's the issue of Turkey. And uh, that deserves some comment, both from an EU point of view, our own strategic point of view, because Turkey is a member of NATO. They're not a member of the EU. And there's great debate as to whether they will become. And they're also a major player in the prophetic end time. So we want to pay a lot of attention to Turkey. And uh, it's obviously very strategically placed between Europe and Asia, tra traditionally so. Well, remember, it was once the capital of the world when the Roman Empire ruled. Everybody thinks of Rome because of our Western European tradition. But the capital of the world was moved in, in 312 to uh, Constantinople. And uh, so Turkey was, it, it ruled it for three times the length or more than, than uh, Rome did. Turkey represents, represents a population of about 65 million and a significant uh, GDP, about 164 billion euros uh, GDP. And so uh, let's take a look a, bit, a little bit at Turkey's background. It was after, with the decline of the Byzantine Empire in the 14th century, Turkish tribes in Anatolia, which is constitutes the eastern two-thirds of what we call Turkey today, established the Ottoman Empire, which lasted all the way from the 14th century all the way uh, to the end of World War I when the modern state of Turkey emerged from that uh, conflict. But you need to understand, to really understand Turkey, you need to understand Ataturk, a very unusual leader, right? Following uh, World War I, Kemal Ataturk aggressively transformed Turkey from a theocratic autocracy under Islam into a Western-oriented democracy. It's a dramatic step. In 1922, he abolished the Sultanate. And in 1924, he abolished the Caliphate and the religious courts. In 1925, he made it illegal to wear the fez, which he regarded as a sign of backwardness. And, uh, but he didn't stop there. After ridding Turkey of the trappings of its Islamic back background, he adopted Western ways. In 1925, Turkey adopted the Western calendar. Can you imagine a culture that goes that far back changing its calendar? I mean, just think about that. That's wild. In 1926, he adopted the Swiss Civil Code and later the Italian Penal Code. In 1928, 1928, he switched to the Latin alphabet. He changed the alphabet of this country. And in 1931, he adopted the metric system. In 1934, all Turks were obliged to take a surname. Mustafa Kemal became Kemal Ataturk. And by the way, the women were also given the vote. So that's his legacy. And now, following World War II, Turkey joined all the main Western institutions. The UN in 1945, the IMF in 1947, the OECD in 1948, the Council of Europe in 49, NATO in 1951. It's a NATO member. That's very important. And in 1963, after four years of application, Turkey received associate membership in the European community with the express condition that they would be allowed full membership. That was the, the lure. That was what they were after. And uh, however, the big problem be began in 1987 because Turkey applied for full membership in the European community, which it was th in those days. And... Uh, it, uh, it, that was specifically what they had been promised. Their application in 87 was ahead of Austria, Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And all those applications were accepted and expedited. Norway declined to finally close, but still they were, they were approved from the Euro EU point of view. So it's now becoming clear to Turkey that they're not welcome, that they've just been rejected under, uh, uh, behind the scenes. Now this gets, they're, they're still trying very, very hard. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you may recall the tensions uh, over the Iraq war. Turkey declined to allow the U.S. use of its bases, despite our commitment to give them, if they would, $80 billion in aid. Can you imagine? And still they balked at that because the pressure was being put onto them by uh, France, and France and Germany both, but especially France. Realize Turkey also had already lost their largest trading partner after the 1991 Gulf War. So the, the, the Middle East, what's interesting as you watch the dynamics, the Middle East isn't the issue to them, it's the European Union. France and Germany are vying for control of that. And pressured by France, um, who obviously was, there's several issues here. One, it, it was, France was uh, previously very favored by oil contracts with Iraq. That's why they were opposing. In fact, France and Germany, both 
are very, the, the anti-American sentiment there is very, very important to understand. Gerard Schroeder won his election by taking an anti-U.S. position, and he's been against us in the U.N., as we'll talk about shortly. And uh, so the anti-U.S. sentiment, not just in Germany and France, but throughout Europe, is, is substantial and growing. We need to realize that. And uh, to get some, this energy issue is a big issue because uh, here's a uh, here's the uh, map of or a uh, chart of the world energy consumption. The United States uses about 25 percent of the world energy. The European Union is 16 percent, but recognize it's a population larger than ours. Their use will be growing even more rapidly than ours, and uh, the rest of the other countries are relatively mild. Even China is only 9 percent, but it also will be growing. So energy is going to increasingly be a very very key aspect of, geo, of the, on the geopolitical horizon. Um, energy production and consumption. On the chart here you see the, the production is in blue and the consumption is in red. And while many of them aren't that bad, you can see that Germany and France are way uh, uh, de just destitute of their own sources of energy. That's why France has invested heavily in nuclear, although your EU is closing some down. So uh, we'll watch to see how that goes. But clearly the source of oil is not so critical in the United States. We import 10, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. But it's crucial for Europe. So Europe's attitude and, and orientation in the Middle East is very different. And uh, their own energy reserves are incredibly modest, just fractional percents of most things. They have 16 percent of the refining capacity, but, but uh, very little uh, 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 capacity. Of, uh, they have only 4.5 percent of the world's crude oil, 9 percent of the world's natural gas, and 7 percent of the world's coal. So they're in trouble in a, in a source of energy mode. Getting back to Turkey, so there are three major factors that seem to be bringing about a, a, a change in the Middle East, especially in regards to Turkey. The deferrals by the European Union of Turkey's application for membership is one of those issues. I might mention when I was at the Air War College, I had the privilege of uh, uh, speaking and discussing this with several of the top Turkish officers. And they're very optimistic that uh, Turkey will be allowed to join the EU. And uh, I think that's interesting because uh, uh, the, the arguments seem to be against, and I'll show you some of them. One is that they've deferred already so long, and the opening up of the Turkic world of Central Asia, that's opening up, and that, that's probably going to be their primary economic opportunity. But the other thing is the rise of Islamic fundamentalism throughout the uh, Turkish world is a very real factor. If you take the, the uh, Muslims in Europe, there's about 7.5% of the population in France is Muslim, about 4%, uh, give or take, 3 or 4%, Netherlands, Germany, Britain, and so forth. The others are a matter of a couple of percent. And that's, uh, that's uh, from The Economist, these statistics. So the Europe in total Muslim population is about 13 million. If Turkey joins the European Union, they will bring in 63 million Muslims in addition. So that's never mentioned on, in any of the ambassador reports and things I've seen, but it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that that is a factor, whether they will admit it publicly or not. So, but the other reason we watch Turkey so intently is because we believe it has a prophetic role. Many of you who are Bible buffs know about the Magog invasion in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which emphasizes the participation of Meshech and Tubal. Those are the two principal cities in ancient Anatolia. So that's a, that's a biblical way of alluding to Turkey, what we call Turkey. And uh, so, the, uh, and although Turkey is a pro-West, a member of NATO, um, it will be surprising to me if they do in fact join the EU because they clearly are a major player in this Russian-led invasion of Israel that is so prominent in biblical prophecy that is yet on our horizon. So, um, and, you know, Magog being the, uh, the forebear of the ancient Scythians, which in turn were the forebear of the true Russians. And, and, they, they, uh, and uh, I won't go through all the tribal names, but if you do your Bible homework, you know that there's famous, this famous invasion of Israel that is the occasion when God intervenes uh, on behalf of Israel in a very dramatic way, and uh, I commend that to your study. But uh, the timing of that battle is controversial among Bible scholars. Many associate it with the... Uh, uh, the 70th, we get the uh, Battle of Armageddon, which climaxes this famous seven-year period. And uh, if, you, if, you, if this is new to you, I encourage you to really study the last four verses of Daniel 9 and understand what we call the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. But most Bible buffs who understand this uh, recognize that the seven-year period climaxes the Battle of Armageddon. Many people, uh, Hal Lindsey and other experts, believe that the, uh, that we, uh, and the Battle of Armageddon is what precipitates the second coming of Christ. That the, uh, battle, the uh, Magog invasion occurs at the end of that seven-year period as part of what we call the Armageddon scenario. There are some of us that uh, 
suspect that the Magog invasion is actually separate, in fact distinct from, happens prior to that whole period of history. And that means that those of us that hold that view, Grant Jeffries, myself, Chuck Smith, and others, we, uh, that means that from our point of view, the Magog invasion could be on our near horizon. And uh, so that's something that's worth doing your own homework, coming to your own conclusions, and watch the papers. We'll see. <laughs> you should also recognize, as we talk about Europe, there's another alliance you should be sensitive to. In 1999, on the 50th anniversary of NATO, NATO redefined itself as a world police force. That chilled our allies as well as our adversaries. And what was a response to that, in two, within two years, the Shanghai Pact was signed in direct response to this move. Russia, China, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, that's virtually almost all of Central Asia, Russia and China, signed the Shanghai Pact, which specifically addresses what they call the hegemony of the United States. So Russia and China's military forces are joining in training operations, practicing to, uh, to be, uh, 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 their war games assume an ultimate war with the United States. And more than once a year, they go through very elaborate exercises for training purposes. And so you need to recognize that we have some major, major antagonism. Not just Europe, we have Russia, China, and Central Asia also as an alliance specifically concerned with the dominance of the United States. So that's something else to be sensitive to and watch. Well, what are the prospects going forward? We've talked about where the European Union is today. Let's look ahead a little bit. There are 48 potential political units that theoretically could make up a combined heartland concept here. And uh, the ones in blue on the chart are the ones already members. The ones in, in uh, um, orange on the chart are those that are, are, are scheduled to join with the enigma of Turkey, uh, assuming they join in this case. And uh, it still leaves a handful of others. Now, that leaves Europe, in any case, with a language problem. There are 38 active official languages in the nations that we're, we've been dealing with. And I won't go through them all. There's, a whole, there, there's actually uh, uh, about eight different groups of languages, Slavic languages, Germanic languages, Romance languages, uh, Celtic, Greek, Albanian, Basque, and so forth, so lots of them. Now, they're talking, they're committed to a single foreign policy. That sounds simple, but it isn't. There's a lot of barriers to that ever really taking place. First of all, several of them are traditional neutrals. Uh, Sweden, Finland, and Ireland, traditionally neutral in these uh, past conflicts. There are many that have colonial possessions that are critical to them. UK, France, Portugal, Spain still have colonial possessions that are at variance here. And uh, the issue of permanent UN Security Council seats comes up. UK and France both have two of the five permanent seats. And, uh, so, and then there's this whole issue of the eastward expansion, which will double the EU membership in the UN. And uh, by the way, in the Security Council, unanimous consensus is required for changes. So the possibility of making any changes at all is, is, is pretty cloudy. As we read this, you say, on the one hand, these are problems. And yet, we can't help but be reminded in Daniel 2 how he speaks of the iron mixed with clay, that it's, it's brittle. It won't adhere. And uh, that's the way he describes the Iron Empire that started you know, in, in the imagery of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's famous dream. We have the iron mixed with clay. So that's one possibility. Maybe this is what is, it, the allusion was to here. The other thing they're providing for is a composite defense. Not all these countries are members of NATO. Sweden, Finland, and Ireland are not. Norway is within NATO, but not in the EU, and uh, so on. So, and then there's the issue of nuclear weapons. This is a thorny one, because both France and UK possess nuclear weapons, and uh, that's going to be a hot topic within their own councils. And of course, there's very differing foreign policies among the members, and that, of course, also clouds their ability for, to mount a common defense. A couple of other things have come along. The steel tariff wars leading to competitive isolation uh, is something that we've experienced uh, between the US and Europe, rather than, uh, we always encourage, over the centuries, or excuse me, over the decades, we encouraged the European unification, believing that we were assisting a potential Atlantic partner. We're discovering that we've really got an isolated competitor rather than a partner. And uh, they're showing up in the tariff wars. There's another way it's showing up. I'll bring this up here. It might be good a place as any. I just received this, that the UN Security Council has approved, which should be routine but wasn't, a one-year exemption for the American peacekeepers from prosecution by the new International War Crimes Tribunal. 
And the, the discussion should have been routine, but France, Germany, and Syria opposed this. It ultimately passed 12 to 0 with three, those three abstaining. But uh, UN Secretary Kofi Annan spoke out strongly against the, uh, the, uh, the uh, prim principle here. He, he wants to make sure there's no thought of making this permanent. The America has been, has been pushing for it to be a permanent change. We oppose the court. We believe that anyone that's not a signature of the court shouldn't be subject to it. The, the Bill Clinton administ administration signed the 1988 Rome Treaty setting up the court, but the Bush administration has rescinded the U.S. signature. And President Bush contends that Americans could be subject to court's jurisdiction even if it's not a party to the pact. That's what he's, he's concerned about. And Washington argues that the court could be used for frivolous or politically motivated prosecutions of American troops. And uh, so in addition to the exemption, it is signed bilateral agreements to 37 countries not to prosecute American officials. That is seeking more. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a tense thing. It's again, this whole global court issue, it's, it's again a place where even the, our, the uh, sovereignty of the United States is being challenged, where we're uh, not part of that court, but there are those that are presuming that that's just inevitable, that eventually we will be. And uh, uh, Britain has discovered, much to their shock, that the micromanaging that occurs in their lives from Brussels is disturbing. They can't, they, 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 Brussels can control whether or not you can run a lawnmower at 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoons and that sort of thing. So uh, there's a, there are some things happening there. So there are some perspectives of tension here. There is an assisted suicide case in Britain that's being appealed to the international court. That shocked the Brits, not the issue, the, 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 the particular uh, issue so much as the fact that, there is, that the, the, the uh, people are looking to the international court as a higher court than the highest court in Britain. And that's troubled the Brits somewhat. While all this is going on, of course, uh, a European and American media are condoning and encouraging the terrorism in Israel in a variety of ways. So we need to watch that. I might mention the European Union has granted 6 billion euros to the Palestinian Authority. So there are some major, major tensions. We won't list them all. Let's get a perspective of Europe in a broader sense. The, the whole world, gross domestic product, Europe accounts for about 28% of the total world, against, which is about equal to the United States, interestingly enough but obviously destined to grow as they take in more of the world in the European Union. And uh, so between the Europe, United States, and the rest of the world, it's roughly balanced. And uh, if you look at the economic summary, of course, Germany and, uh, is clearly the leader in the, European, the existing membership, France running a second, France and uh, United Kingdom about a toss-up between them. And uh, what's interesting, if you resort the slide by um, average mean income, Luxembourg, of course, comes to the top where the average in here is about 25,000 euros, uh, Luxembourg is about 58. So it's obviously a small conclave of professionals and well-paid people. But uh, the candidate economies of the ones that are joining, uh, Poland and Czech Republic and Hungary are being the largest of the, of the, uh, the three largest of the uh, 10. But uh, it, it, uh, we'll put this all together in a summary here. The European members today constitute a population base of 340 million people. By 2004, they're going to add 75 million to that, and uh, 2007, another 31 million. So they'll have a population base, not counting Turkey, of 446 million population. They'll collectively constitute an economic gross domestic product of about 9.7 billion, or point, nine, excuse me, 9.7 trillion um, euros. And, uh, now, the United States has a gross domestic product of about 10, a little, a shade over 10 uh, trillion uh, euros against a population base of about 280 million. You say, gee, that, that's pretty interesting. They have a population base much larger than ours and a GDP approximating close to ours. It's worse than that. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, in other words, they have, in 2004, they'll be 48% larger. In, 69, in uh, 2007, they'll be 60% larger than we are. Now, this is not a backward economy. Here's R&D investment of uh, the e Europe, the EU, and Japan, just to give you a perspective. Europe is, is, is coming right along uh, in their R&D commitments. Let's talk a little bit about common currency. One of the things I didn't really emphasize in the previous historical rundown was the role of common currency in the formation and the control of the Roman Empire. The Romans used coins about six, at least 290 BC, if not sooner. And they issued these coins bearing the name of the ruling emperor. So these coins were used from Scotland to the Sahara and from Portugal to Iran. 
They were an informal way of, uh, uh, of, of uh, providing cohesion, economic cohesion. Because if you're traveling, you, they would be recognized and they had, they had value just by virtue of their, their mint, mintage. And the Romans, as they started conquering tribes, of course, carried these throughout uh, the regions that they, uh, they went. And at a time when it took two months to travel from London uh, to Rome, uh, this centralized authority uh, implied by the coins is a powerful uh, element of cohesion. In fact, in the third century, Emperor uh, Caracalla is said to have ordered the entire population of Thrace uh, into slavery for refusing to use the standard Roman uh, coinage. Uh, Thrace is roughly equivalent to Bulgaria, but apparently the emperor had them all ordered them all sold into slavery for failure to countenance the Roman coin. So that was a factor in, in, in the Roman uh, uh, era that we overlook. That, uh, so even as it starts to come apart, there's a cultural commonality that's in, in, in uh, constant to all of them. In the 8th century, Charlemagne established uniform silver coinage in establishing uh, his empire. In the ninth century, there's another thing that happened. The Donegeld was a, a, a form of coin. It was a form of tribute paid by terrified countries to prevent uh, uh, attacks by the marauding Vikings. And that was, strangely enough, a form of tribute that became widely used in the Scandinavian area. Napoleon considered trying to enforce a uniform uh, 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 currency. And the Latin Monetary Union and the Scandinavian Monetary Union are both attempts at this, but they really failed. They weren't very successful. But the euro, of course, is the emergent currency from the European Union. It, uh, it was in view from the Treaty of Rome back in 86, the Single European Act, the Treaty of European Act in 92. But it really takes shape in 1999 with the European Monetary Union formalized. And 2001, the euro was introduced as a legal currency. There are 12 member states, out of 15 members, 12 are participating. Denmark, Sweden, and the United Kingdom are not currently participating, but it's going to be a hot topic for Tony Blair in the UK. And uh, so there, there are arguments both ways. I won't take you through that. We'll just watch with great interest as it unfolds. But something else is going on. The European Central Bank has been quietly stockpiling gold, pursuing the goal of making the euro an asset-based currency in contrast to the dollar, US dollar, which is a debt-based currency. And uh, they've been quietly acquiring gold through Canada from several uh, companies, uh, Newmont and uh, Barrick and some others. And uh, so they're very quietly, very low profile, but they're, they appear to be stockpiling gold. This is apparently well known within the gold traders. Well, what's happened, though, also in the last uh, uh, recent months, let's say a year and a half, more, is the euro has gone from its 85 cents to uh, $1.19. And uh, the implications of that are, and it's very steady, and the implications of that are extremely profound. Let's examine some of the implications. We generally, most of us, I'm guilty of it too, think that well, a, a euro is like a dollar. Well, not quite. Um, the, uh, the U.S., in terms of central bank reserves, about 68% of the banks use dollars for um, uh, as their reserves, but 13% and growing are the euros, according to the International Mon Monetary Fund last year. But the chief economist from the Deutsche Bank made an interesting mark. He says a lot of the central banks, particularly in Asia, where the dollar volume is the most important, are shifting reserves from dollar reserves to, into euros. That, that's already starting to happen. And the bond market, the U.S. still constitutes about 46% of the bond market, the euro about 24%, but growing. The yen about 19%, just for perspective. And uh, now, let's go back and look at this chart that deals with the EU GDP. 9.7 trillion uh, euros is their GDP against our $10 trillion. But we just found out that the euro is worth $1.19, which means in equivalent terms, the European economy here, collect, here totalized as of 2007, assuming these, these member states join in and allowing no growth for them so far, uh, you're still talking about a collective economy that's about 14% larger than the U.S. is today. And that comes as a shock. It didn't to me when I was doing the research for this, for this briefing. I knew it was getting close. I had no re didn't realize it had actually eclipsed it. And uh, the, uh, the uh, 
population base is about 60% larger. And you say, well, gee, yes, but it's agriculture. Yes, but it's growing. These are not illiterates. These are, this is a cultural tradition that uh, values education. Uh, they will be, uh, they're doing something different. See, we, we get our low cost labor through NAFTA in Mexico and what have you. Um, what they're doing is they're, they're taking the low cost labor, bringing it in under the shelter, it'll be in their tax base. So as these countries grow and prosper, it will strengthen the, the federated union, if you will. And uh, the mean income per capita is worth taking a look at here, because if you look at these, the, the, the ones that are joining here, you've got uh, everything from 15,000 euros per annum down to 2,000 in Lithuania. Uh, uh, Cyprus, Slovenia, and Malta being at the top of the list. Most of these say are four or 5,000 uh, euros per year mean income. And, uh, and of course, uh, Romania and Bulgaria is down in the 2000 uh, ca 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 uh, category also. The EU members have a, a income of average, a mean income of about 27,000 euros per year. The ones joining in 2004 are 5,000, 2007, less than 2,000. So that all represents opportunity for growth. Just bring, as they will naturally, as they, they prosper and things go, they, 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 their, their, their means will begin to approx approximate the uh, pre existing members. So they have, they'll have a composite about 21,000 per year, but that'll obviously be growing. That's against the United States, 35,000, or I'll call it $36,000 per year, mean income in the United States, just to give you a perspective of this. And uh, of course, the EU being substantially larger in its potential, it gets kind of interesting. Well, let's, you know, we talk a lot about global government, and that's part of what's going on here. Let's talk a little bit about the EU's UN participation. Uh, the the uh, the UN, UN nation, the uh, EU nations on the uh, United Nations Security Council, France, Germany, and Spain, and the UK. Two of these are permanent members, as well as one nation currently applying for membership uh, in the EU. That's Bulgaria as a member, and they'll be applying for membership uh, in the EU too. See, all EU members and candidates are members of the UN itself. They have nine spots on the Economic and Social Council. The EU will make up 25 of the 191 members, about 13%, just in terms of the you know, General Assembly. Let's talk about budget. This surprised me too. This is, this is the support of the regular budget. The European Union provides 37% of the UN budget. The United States provides 23%. I didn't realize that. I thought we were the big gorilla in the block. Apparently not. Apparently, the, from the official numbers, I see the European Union's 37% against the US is 23%. And Japan, about 20%, and all the others add up to 20%. That's the regular budget. They have a separate peacekeeping budget. And of that, the United States provides 28%. The European Union provides 40%. I was startled by that. Very surprising. And this is the, uh, the year 2001 to 2003 perspective here. So EU is, uh, is again, the big gorilla on the block here. Now, in the Security Council, there's 15 members, five permanent seats, 10 elected by the General Assembly for two-year terms. And uh, decisions require an affirmative uh, vote by at least nine, including all five permanent members. That's where you get this idea of the veto. So all five have to agree on anything that goes on. And you should realize that the UN Security Council is the, is the only entity that has the power to impose oblig obligatory policies, at least so far. And uh, so that's a big issue. And uh, there's all kinds of proposals for changes. But it'll take unanimous, uh, unanimous consent for changes, so they have a little likelihood of happening. Moscow's provided, uh, uh, proposed that the uh, Security Council include five other permanent members, enlarge it, in other words. Germany, Japan, one Asian country, one African country, one American country. And they're also proposing that India become a permanent uh, Security Council member. And uh, Italy and Spain both have claimed the right to be represented on the Security Council. So there's a lot of tensions and, and jockeying around, and that'll, that cauldron will continue to bubble. You can't talk about Europe without at least taking a quick look at the Vatican. And it shocked me to realize in recent years how the, what the, the people I regard as the most conservative in a religious sense um, are the people trying to lead the ecumenical uh, movement. Most of us, I think, recognize that biblical Christianity is increasingly becoming uh, politically incorrect, in many, in, in, even here in America. And what's interesting to me is it's the Vatican that's positioning for global ecumenical leadership. That's important to understand because it's, you really won't understand the history of Europe unless you have studied the tensions. The, the, most of the wars in Europe w resulted from the grappling for power, temporal power, by the Vatican. 
And uh, you, need to, you need to understand that. If you haven't studied that, I encourage you to take a look at the briefing pack Dave Hunt and I did, called the, we call The Kingdom of Blood, or better yet, get his book called The Woman Rides the Beast, one of the best documented books on this issue. Essential reading for any serious Christian. But in any case, the Vatican's a major player here. And to give you some feeling here, the Vatican has endorsed the Quran. So you need to realize it's, it's all power here. And you combine the billion uh, Muslims with uh, the existing power base of the Vatican, it's very shrewd politics, but it's very disturbing in terms of long-term implications. Now it's interesting, this has already come up where the Vatican didn't have the leverage you might think they had. Uh, there's currently going on the Convention for the Future of Europe, forming a draft constitution for Europe. And uh, the mention of God and Christianity has been deleted from those drafts. And the secularists have uh, contended that, quote, a clearly pluralist modern Europe has moved beyond any reference to any particular religion, is their quote. And even when the former Irish Prime Minister, John Burton, formally uh, proposed, including, and by the way, his, his uh, uh, constitution actually has opens with a mention of the Holy Spirit. He proposed including a mention of Christianity and the proposal failed to muster any enough support. So the document with all that exp uh, expurgated from it, it now goes to the 25 member uh, countries for parliamentary pr approval. So we're beginning to see that complexion it shouldn't surprise us. Something else you should be aware of that colors all of this in my mind and that's the national anthem. It may surprise you to discover that Europe does indeed have a national anthem. They take it very seriously. And uh, it's an incredible piece of music. It's Beethoven's ninth so-called choral symphony in D minor, opus 125. And the choral stand, uh, he shocked the musical world by having a, a, uh, uh, the curtains open and, and a choral group uh, singing words to a symphony. That was just unheard of in those days. But anyway, the stanzas were adapted by Beethoven from uh, Schiller's Ode to Joy, a famous German poet. In German it says, Freude, Tochter, aus Elysium, deine Zauber, Binden, Wieder, was die Mode strength geteilt. Alle Menschen würden Brüder, wo dein Sonster, Flügel weilt. Or putting it in English, um, Joy, O daughter of Jew Elysium, thy pure magic frees all others held in customs rigid rings. Men throughout the world are brothers in the haven of thy wings. It's a call to world federation, interestingly enough. And uh, so, it's incredible music. You, obviously, every time you hear uh, that, you, it'll ring in your ears for days. And uh, I first thought this was just a, a side issue, but when I was in the European Parliament, I had the opportunity to actually pick up the earphones, and when nothing else is going on, which is, was when I was passing through there, uh, picked it up, and they, it's playing. The, the, it, it re, that, re, that is their national anthem. Very interesting. Well, we've uh, reviewed in these two sessions the biblical background as to why scholars have for decades been looking for a reemergence of the Roman Empire. And it certainly would seem that the foundation of that's being set. We reviewed the fragmentation of Western Europe. Now remember the Eastern leg endured for another thousand years, but the fragmentation of Western Europe uh, occurred very much the, as, as uh, suggested by Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We followed the aspirations of a Holy Roman Empire through several iterations in Europe's subsequent history. And uh, we took it all the way through to the end of World War II, uh, where we see the reemergence of what I'll call Rome II, apparently emerging on our horizons, the European Union. We talked about it today, and uh, we talked a little bit of what's forthcoming in the next few years, 2004, 2007 acquisitions. And so the real question in our minds is, okay, what's next? And uh, it's very easy, perhaps, you can say, gee, we're just reading into uh, the Bible, the current events as we see them. And it's always uh, a possibility. So let's examine what other things are very unlikely to happen on the current geopolitical horizon, and yet would seem to be suggested by the biblical text. What about the eastern leg? Remember, Nebuchadnezzar's dream had, the, 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 had two legs, a western and eastern one. And to the best of my awareness, there is no thought, even uh, uh, from the visionary dreamers in Europe, of reaching to the to Middle East. And yet, if we take the Bible seriously, it would seem that somewhere, somehow, the ancient eastern leg, what we call the Byzantine Empire, has a role to play here somehow. Is it going to emerge somehow? 
That sounds preposterous today, but I love those kinds of things because it's, the, because it's not likely in our horizon. If and when it does happen, it'll cause you to go back to the scripture and read it more carefully. There's another issue that gets mixed with this whole reemergence of, of the Roman Empire, Rome II, if you will, and that is, will a super leader of some kind emerge, and when will that happen, and who will he be? And uh, he goes by many different names. There's 33 titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. He's got many labels. We tend to call him, or some groups tend to call him, the Antichrist. And uh, so where will he emerge from? Traditionally, many scholars have taken for granted that he will emerge out of the Roman Empire, and from that they assume it's Western Europe. Maybe not. From Micah 5 and Isaiah 10 and some other passages, there's strong indication indicate that he will come out of the eastern leg, in fact, literally out of Iraq, Syria area. And uh, there's also big debate. Is he a Gentile? Is he a Jew? There's arguments both ways. Well, everybody forgets there's two guys. It's a duet. Read Revelation 13. So there's a whole issue there, a place where you do some serious study because there's much speculation on the horizon. The Assyrian idea is emphasized in Micah 5, verses 5 and 6, Isaiah 10, several passages in Ezekiel and elsewhere. Another issue is what will the role of Babylon be? It's interesting that through the whole Iraq war, the most important city in Iraq was never mentioned. The city of Babylon that Saddam Hussein had begun the rebuilding of. It has a huge destiny that many, even good Bible scholars, haven't focused on. And uh, what will its role be? And uh, it's my anticipation that you're going to see an increasingly important role for Babylon to emerge in the coming months and years. Watch for it. It should be exciting. Is, is this a literal city on the banks of the Euphrates? I believe Isaiah and Jeremiah make that very clear. On the other hand, is it a coded symbol of some kind? That's what Dave Hunt developed so thoroughly in his, his uh, book, uh, Woman Rides the Beast. Or could it be that both of these ideas are somehow commingled, which is our view? But uh, check it out, do your homework, and just watch the, watch the news broadcast, because all these things are surfacing. And that leaves a primary challenge that I want to leave you with before we close. And it's an assertion that I'm going to make that I'm counting on you to challenge. It's so preposterous. I hope you don't just accept it. I hope, but you, I hope you will take the effort to challenge it. I believe that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in human history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now that's, that's a preposterous statement. I'm suggesting that you and I are moving into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about the gospel period. Now the way you challenge this idea is you've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible really says about these things, not what Chuck Missler or some or whoever your favorite prophecy buff might be. Find out for yourself what the text really says and be very precise about it. That's the easy part. The other thing you need to do is find out what's going on. That's not so easy because we have a mainline news media that has agenda, an agenda of its own. But fortunately, with the helps that are around, especially on the Internet and so forth, with a little effort, you can find out anything if you know what questions to ask. So find out what the Bible really says and find out what's really going on. And I think what you're going to discover is some exciting things. We monitor, have traditionally monitored 10 strategic trends that are impacting all of us, our, our nations, our communities, our families, our persons. There are 10 strategic trends we monitor on, the, on our website. You check it out. The rise of the European superstate. We've talked about that in this particular briefing. And uh, the, we touched briefly on ecumenical religion and global government. They're, they're related topics in a sense. We haven't talked about weapons of mass destruction. What do they play? What's their biblical background? And how do they play out in our future? What forcing functions do they impose on, on us geopolitically? The rise of Islam, major factor. Tragic illiteracy in this country that's prey to the propaganda. Find out what Islam really believes. Find out what its agenda is. Find out for yourself. And the struggle for Jerusalem. Here's a topic that as we're having this briefing, the late lights are burning in every capital around the world, struggling what issue to take about the city of Jerusalem. That's exactly what Zechariah predicted would happen and will endure until the Prince of Peace comes. And the Magog invasion we touched on briefly, but that's a whole study in its own right. The rise of China as a super state. You know, for 50 years, the world has had a balance due to the tension between two superpowers, USSR and the USA. It appears that in the coming decades, the two dominant powers on the planet Earth will be Asia on the one hand, Europe on the other. 
And uh, that has implications for all of us. Biotech and global pestilence. Every day in the paper, there's some issue here. This is a very, very key topic in our lives in general and in your biblical perspective in particular. And of course, all this leads to what I'll call the American challenge. Where are we headed? What's going to happen in our country? And that's a topic for another briefing. Now, we do have resources we'd like to make available to you. Let me invite you. Uh, we, we publish a monthly, a 48-page monthly news journal. And we'll give you a year's subscription free of charge just by calling us and asking for it. It's our attempt to, sh to highlight the biblical relevance of current events. And we encourage you to take a look at it. We hope you find it useful. Uh, by all means, check out our website. Our, minist our ministry is called Koinonia House. No one can pronounce it, let alone spell it. So everyone calls us K-House. So our website is khouse.org, K-H-O-U-S-E dot O-R-G. Our, our phone number is 1-800-K-House-1. And K H O U S E, and then the numeral one. We, on the website, we monitor our strategic trends. All this is free access for you. We also make available, free of charge, a weekly emailed newsletter, just a one pager, that describes what happened this week that's biblically relevant. And it will give you the links to those websites that are competently following that particular uh, special interest. And it's all free. If you just sign on our website, give us your email address, we'll give, that to, uh, give you that once a week until you tell us to, to turn it off for some reason. And the other agenda we want to encourage, one of our primary efforts is to encourage you to participate in a home uh, fellowship of some kind. Uh, some of these are sponsored by churches, some of these are used just on their own, but we encourage you to get, find, to examine, explore, find a home fellowship to participate in. If you can't find one, start one, and we'll be glad to help you. Because we're moving into the most exciting times in history, but you need to be prepared for it by doing your homework. God bless you.